like I said, part of the the things that I was trying to um, deal with was like, what is my purpose? Like, what what do I want my days to look like in in regards to like pursuing my passions in life? Um, and at that time, it was like around starting. Like, I wanted to start a company of my own. I wanted to, or if not that, I wanted to work for a company that I was like on the ground level at. And um, <clears throat> I I wanted to have freedom. So part of it is uh, I felt like that was the best way to leverage what I was good at morning y'all this is just uh good wishes from uh austin texas keeping it weird with you know mcconaughey and willie nelson and now elon musk but uh just a big big thanks for this mud water deliciousness keeps me going uh, i work in fitness um and there's nothing more in alignment with really how i think and live my life i'm about to go and make some of that goodness right now and I usually you know try and get some morning sunshine in a little walk with the pups I wish I could send pictures of them to you instead of this dull recording but uh yeah I mean it's just a really nice feeling to know that uh I don't have to rush down and make a cup of coffee you know in anticipation of a headache or something of that sort uh you know it's just a real blessing mud you know lotus grows from the mud what can I say right Thanks, guys. Hey, Christy from Austin, Texas. Thank you for sending that in. We got some mud water coming at you. So enjoy. If anyone else wants to send a voice memo in, just bust out your phone, record less than a minute of audio, let us know who you are, what you all about. And if we play it on the podcast, we'll send you a free tin of mud. You can send those voice memos to podcast at mudwtr.com and please just include your name and address in the email. Welcome to Trends of Benefits. My name is Kyle Tierman and this episode is with the co-founder and CEO of Mudwater, Shane Heath. I had him on the podcast in episode 17. We're doing these um, founders episodes where it's kind of like a stream of consciousness journal into his journey of starting this company and growing it. Uh, we find that being honest and self-effacing is one of the best marketing strategies out there while sprinkling in a little bit of humor. So uh, I've known Shane for a long time, and sometimes I can pull those stories out of him. Um, and I think that they're of value because uh, he's on a wild ride and whether or not you're starting your own company or just trying to navigate the uh, craziness that is life, um, I think that Shane is handling it fairly, fairly well. Um, he has not purchased a white tiger and uh, gone full Scarface on us yet, so we're in the clear, everyone. We're in the clear. Um, I hope that you all enjoy this episode. This was the, um, the second edition. He talked a bit about um, a formative trip in his life, um, the fundraising that went into Mudwater, um, and hiring employees, um, and uh, a couple other funny stories. So with that, please get... Oh, always forget... We got the newspaper out, everyone. It's incredible. We made a newspaper. It's called Trends with Benefits, and you can get yours uh, for 25 cents on mudwtr.com. Click the shop button, scroll down, and get the Trends with Benefits newspaper. Got all kinds of fun stories in there, and we will deliver it by Paragon Falcon to your doorstep. So please welcome to the show the co-founder and CEO of Mudwater. Shane Heath. Where do you want to start? Like what? Because like we're already into like starting mud, but I want to kind of maybe backtrack, which could help as like a prelude to this episode um, into like what allowed me to have maybe like the the courage and like the tools to start mud, I guess. What allowed you to do that? Because like... What's up? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, starting a company, I I mean, at the time when I did it, it didn't feel that scary to me. Um, and I think that for most people, they uh, 
are somewhat surprised by that because people are like, how did you get the courage to, you know, take the leaf of faith and put your, your, yourself on the line? Cause you're kind of putting your personal brand on the line and saying like, I, I believe in this, like this is going to work out. And if it doesn't, it's like, you kind of feel like you're falling on your face a little bit. Right. Um, but at the time for me, it wasn't too big of a, a leap. And I think that that was due to a few tools like practices that I was partaking in um, a few key experiences and uh, a few individuals as well Um, and so I I think you know obviously the the whole story of like my life all contributed but um, specifically after that art residency in Goa India um, I spent a month on this island chain off the coast of India on the east off the east coast to surf um, India isn't really known for surfing. And like I was saying before, there, even if it, even if there was waves, it wouldn't be like widely known just because water sports haven't like taken hold of culture. But, um, I knew a couple people who surfed there, like living there for six months and they told me where to go. And I'm not going to tell you where to go, but <laughs> you should go there and find it. <laughs> but off the coast of India, there's an island chain that's owned by India. Um, it's actually closer to Thailand. And so it's pretty remote and, uh, really popular, where you fly in is a very popular scuba diving spot. But if you know, you can jump on a ferry and you go like 11 hours on this like very rugged ferry down to this, the southernmost island in this chain. And it's a very remote island. There's no, there's no cell service there. There's no, there's no internet there. There's like really no connection to the outside world. Um, besides at this one elementary school that I found um where I would go in and like sneak onto their computers but it was like full dial-up style like yeah it took me like I just needed yeah. to send an email to my mom and it took me like an hour <laughs> just, how I'm many okay. how many months into your trip in India were you at this point so this is six uh this is like five and a half months in it's a good long trip yeah so I was in Goa for five and a half months and then I flew out to this island and was planning to stay there for a month um and so I, I arrived there I, I went there with a friend um, and he was going to stay for just two weeks, um, but really good surfer. So he was super excited to go out there and, um, we get there and the Island is just like, so it, what's beautiful about India is like, they don't, it's a, it's an amazing place to go. Like I would highly suggest everyone go, but like, they don't, it doesn't feel like they care whether you're there or not. You know, like mm-hmm. a lot of, um, tourist destinations, it feels like the whole culture and country like shifted to accommodate these like transients coming in to party. In India, it's kind of like, come if you want, like leave when you want. It's like it, it's yeah. not form, it's not um, formed to like meet your your needs, and so it feels very raw and organic. And um, and for me, that that was I, I really appreciated that. Yeah, it changes the whole experience when the culture is catering to tourism. Mm-hmm. But it, India doesn't really do that. To yeah, the you're same. kind of forced just to jump in the stream with everyone else, and that's sort of the experience I wanted. And this island specifically was even was like more extreme than like a Goa type experience. Um, Did you bring a surfboard with you? Yeah. Really? Yeah, we both we both brought surfboards. Yeah, I, even I, even in Goa, um, I surfed. Oh, really? Yeah. It wasn't at the art, it wasn't at the art residency. At the art residency, yeah. Yeah, it was like a re- every day was like, uh, the best days was like the worst days ever at Manresa. Sure. <laughs> so y- did you grow up surfing in Santa Cruz? Yeah. Yeah, I grew up surfing, but um, I never was, I never like went all in, you know, like a lot of our friends were, were like pros and I was like, I'm probably not going to be, this isn't going to be like my, my thing. Right. So like I, I did like it a lot, um, but I definitely saw other avenues that were um, going to be my thing yeah for people who don't know surfing in santa cruz is a religion yeah it's it's It's, very it's like football in texas or hunting in montana everybody surfs and the the king of the football team is the best surfer in school Mm -hmm. so it doesn't take much to it's good and we have great waves here so it doesn't take much to get into it yeah and it's not like like shaka super like chill mentality it's like a competitive sport from the very early on yeah. even if you're not competing you're like competing with everyone else in the water it's it's sport built on scarcity really um but yeah so in india it was it was fun there's like no one surfing i would surf a lot i did a lot of stand-up paddle boarding and whatnot but um really not good waves and go but supposedly where i was going had amazing waves so went out there um me and i was with deva yeah yes uh so we both know deva and we check into our quote-unquote hotel, which is uh, 
it was called like the rainbow lodge or something and these are like literal like wood shacks in their dollar a night and Whoa. there's yeah and they're like i i met friends who like had like went into their bed and like pulled the sheets off and like a full-size snake is in their bed <laughs> <laughs> like this place is like <laughs> they're like when tours come we'll put them up here but yeah. like nobody's coming right yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nobody's coming out authentic here. experience yeah. um but you know like anything like you get used to that and um getting to the wave was even an experience so we both had scooters and like nobody surfs there's no locals who surf which is very unique as well not a single person like i was we were riding around town trying to find where the wave was or where the entry point to find the wave is and people didn't even know like what we were talking about like they're just like pointing us to the beach and there's like like the wrong spot really wow it's such a uh weird one when you go to a place with waves and there's yeah. no surf culture no surf culture at all it's totally yeah, there, so there's bizarre. no like stickers everywhere nothing, like nothing. if you go to bali the there's whole no surf thing shops, is catered to it right nothing. it's it's really cool really cool um and we like we were just riding around couldn't get any directions where to go and finally like i see this cutoff that looks like a, a single track bike trail that you would see up in like Nicene Marks or something like that and I'm like Nicene, Mark, just, Nicene Marks is like a bike trail that we have bike, around Santa Mecca, Cruz yeah. sure. um, and I was like let's try this it like looked like it was heading in the general direction of the sea and we're on scooters and this is like a mountain bike trail like there's like it's not like well groomed or anything it's like rocks everywhere and like downhill and uphill climbs and we're just like going no joke for 15 minutes on this trail like it's long and we're on scooters and Dave was like we should, we should turn back <laughs> and I'm like no, and we, we go, like, a little bit further, and we get to this spot, and we, like, turn off our scooters, and you could just hear the ocean, and we look to our right, and you could kind of see the beach, and so we jump off our scooters and walk out, and we're kind of, like, walking through, and there's, like, a swamp over here, and we heard, like, this place is notorious for um, saltwater crocs, and we're kind of like, oh, shit, uh, look, let's keep going, let's keep going, and uh, we get out to the beach, and uh, we, yeah, we're, we're on the track, right, and then we see the beach, and it opens up, and it's just this huge, empty bay, and to our left, we look out, and it's this point, and there's this perfect left hand, like overhead waves coming in on this point, and it, we just like hugged each other. We're like, yeah! <laughs> like it was crazy. Like there's no one there, and we felt like we just earned something, and uh, and yeah, we go out, and that that was where we'd go every day. Surf there every day. Um, there's maybe like five other tourists, you know, that would, would come and go throughout the month that I was there. But like, there was never really a lineup. I had multiple days where I was surfing by myself. Wow, like, it, what it was a just, fun trip. It was nuts. Um, and one little small snapple fact about this place is they have, uh, Komodo dragons, but they're like called, they're called monitor lizards. So they're a little smaller, but they're like four feet and, um, monitor lizards when they don't, uh, like they'll bite you, but they don't like bite to to kill you they bite you and their um their mouths have so much bacteria that they slowly kill you and they just wait for you to die and then they then they get you whoa yeah how many and, how like how mm, long does it take to for one of these like, things to kill you like hours like hours. not that long and so um <laughs> and so, it can kill a human yeah yeah full on yeah and so, so they don't typically like hunt during the day they so and what people used to do is because that trail kind of takes a long time people would just like camp out on the beach which and the beach is really just like the jungle the jungle goes right up to the, the reef and um and people would get bit by these things in the middle of the night and like a couple of people died and uh and so we, <laughs> i was aware of that and one time i was riding my scooter back and by the time i was like two weeks in like i was like racing this court like yeah, it was like yeah. a course like yeah. i was just like i knew every turn I, you're local with the wave I was, now yeah, i was try, <laughs> i was doing like time trials and stuff on a scooter like i was way too too comfortable on a scooter but i round this corner and the entire trail is taken up by a monitor lizard and i was just like whoa and i had to stop and i was like five feet from it and it just like looked at me and i looked at it and just then it just ran off <laughs> but just like, like, this is my wave this is bro my zone. <laughs> um but anyways what i wanted to get to was because it was so remote um and there was nothing to do at night or anything like i was wake i was going to bed at eight and waking up at five and surfing like that kind of uh schedule and i brought this book with me called you are the placebo by joe dispenza and now i've come to realize that i mean joe dispenza is amazing and i but i really view it as kind of like a really good gateway into um gaining control of your own healing um and and uh building a relationship with your mind 
Um, so some of his meditations and his teachings are really good for that. And I think that like, it's led me down further, deeper paths. But at the time it was just like, perfect for where I was at. Yeah, Joe Dispenza had a really bad spine injury. I yeah, believe, so that's and... how the book starts is he had this car crash and basically like he, he was uh, offered the opportunity to like fuse his spine, which means that he would basically be like very inhibited in movement. And so he being, an, he was a neuroscientist, so he understood the inner workings of the mind um, and began meditating. Like I'm pretty sure he lied down face down on a massage table for like a couple hours every day. And he would put himself into what's called like a, a belief state, like I'm very where his mind was very malleable, and it's called you are the placebo because he's essentially like harnessing the power of his own belief, um, which placebo is essentially that like because you believe the doctor gave you the pill that was blue, it was a sugar pill, but you believed that it was something and it worked. So what if you could you could essentially be your own doctor and and tell yourself things that you believed and so he'd get himself in these states and um guide himself through these meditations and visualize the fusing of his spine within a couple weeks he was walking and he's great he's fine so did you start doing this while you were on the trip yeah so i had this book and i was in this location with literally nothing to do besides surf and eat and sleep and avoid dragons and avoid dragons (laughs) and i started doing his uh they're like hour and a half long meditations every day And they're very, they're like, it was work. Like, it's not something, it's not like a calm, like, relaxing meditation. Like, you're doing, like, work. Like, he's he's pulling you into these, like, first, the the first, like, 30, 40 minutes is a meditation and kind of getting you into that malleable state, so that part's relaxing. But then the work begins, and he kind of, like, pulls you into, like, previous life experiences and um, belief states about yourself that you no longer want to feel and making, like, having you feel that on and the expansiveness of your body at that time and it kind of sucks and it's hard work and then and then he pulls you out of that and into like how you really want to feel and back and forth and back and forth over the course of an hour and a half and um where would you do these meditations just in my in my hut in my dollar a night hut in the sketchy little snake hut yeah one okay. time one time a uh, like a rat just like crawled up the wall into the roof. It was like a thatched <laughs> hut. I was like, "Hey, little buddy, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't call you it, in it in my the, vision." Yeah, it was. Um, so, what did you deal with? Rugged. Tell me about all your insecurities. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't want to go too deep into that, but I mean, there's some insecurities around previous relationships that were brought up. Things I wanted to deal with there. Um, insecurities around, uh, like my voice. Like I think on the on the previous episode we talked about that time with like the doing jujitsu with my sister and feeling my voice just like cut. And because of that, like it grew into like a skill set of like, I I was a good writer growing up and I, and I love, I really enjoy writing, have some typos still, but I'm working on it. But like, (laughs) I love the art of copywriting. I love the art of painting. I love the art of design. And a lot of the reason there is because I can kind of go off into my room and and I, I can't get my voice shut off and I can present it in full fledged perfection of what I wanted to express. And I love that. But I knew I wanted to develop my voice. Um, I wanted to, you know, quote unquote, free my voice again, find my voice. So that was that was another thing. And then just overall understanding what my purpose is in life. Um, so I would equate them to th- those three things. So like relationships, expression and purpose. So once you would get into these meditations, For example, if you're tackling insecurity around your voice, wanting to have stronger, uh, a stronger voice, how would you, uh, how would you attack that or approach it or work through it in these meditations? Yeah. So it would start with feeling the feeling that you don't want to feel anymore, right? Like I, like building a relationship with the thing that you're dealing with. Like Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we ignore it and push it away and it may be manifest in strange ways but really like facing that like when I felt nervous in front of the class that one time like really like sit there and feel that in my body remember it identify it almost like personify it like I I remember that person now like that entity Um, so that's like one aspect and then the hard part is trying to envision the exact same experience or a similar experience but feeling completely different um which is tough because you have years of life experience and patterning to the contrary. Um, but it's, it's very doable and it's really, uh, empowering where you're, cause once you get over the, like, 
all right, even though this is hard, like I, I can't imagine it. Like it feels uncomfortable because part of me, there's like a voice that's like, you can't do that. Like, that's not you. You remember what happened, you know, like that kind of thing. Your little schmeagle voice. But that's the purpose. That's why you do it over right. and over is because over time that becomes you and the other you becomes the past and this thing that you can kind of point at and be like, I remember that. Um, so that that really is like the the nature of his work and why that book was like that's a book that I recommend to so many people um especially people who are dealing with like a transition in their life or or like a tough time uh, it's been super tra- it's been very transformative for me would you do a, the first meditation think of yourself in the in the past in the way that you didn't want to react and then go through that same situation again in a way that you would and yeah. was that the whole meditation kind of well the the first part is a meditation putting sure. yourself in the malleable belief state and then from there then it's the sequence of going back and forth between the two like maybe three times or so um but when you're doing it it's not just like imagining it in your mind it's really trying to like embody the feeling like deeply both on both sides um and especially on what you're trying to bring about uh which is something that I now do daily pretty much um where like when I'm thinking about something that I want to bring into the world like I'm not just use I'm not cognitively thinking about it I'm emotionally thinking about it like what is the feeling come up and those like you can't really put words on that but like there's a like you, I've built like I think we all can build this like muscle in us that it's hard to explain but it's like an emotional muscle and um, that's really where the magic happens in, in that particular um, meditation sequence that he's teaching. That's a powerful tool. Yeah. So did powerful. you stick with that as you mm. came back, started MUD? I mean, you're. we left off last time as you had just launched MUD, you were getting a few subscribers, there was mud on your ceiling. You were fulfilling all the orders by yourself. Yeah. You were running out of cash as you were trying to get more product yeah. in. And it you know, it seemed like you were kind of coming apart at the seams in a lot of ways. A little bit, yeah. So some of the things that kept those seams from coming apart was this. It wasn't that I necessarily continued doing these hour-long meditations every day. I think it, I think it is important to do the work and then kind of like let the work like happen in your life um i've heard a lot of uh coaches in regards to like manifesting change like talk about if you like sit in that space for for ever like you're constantly recalling the the space of lack or like like acknowledging that you don't have that yet or something you know like just start living it out and what's interesting that i've seen is i went connecting the dots backwards i almost like forget forgot what i was thinking about on the over there um on these islands and 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 then i remember and i'm like whoa like just seeing how it really did like create this wave in my life um well you got to show up in the arena super sooner or later right you can't just be the guy practicing forever that's exactly like that's the way that i feel about people who are you know they want to be actors and all they do is take acting lessons Mm. right it's like sooner or later you just got to show up for the fucking audition yeah, that's spot on. Um, so after this trip, I I came back home to Santa Cruz for a brief amount of time. Um, it, like I said, part of the, the things that I was trying to um, deal with was like, what is my purpose? Like, what what do I want my days to look like in, in regards to like pursuing my passions in life? Um, and at that time, it was like around starting, like I wanted to start a company of my own. I wanted to, or if not that, I wanted to work for a company that I was like on the ground level at and um why I I wanted to have freedom so part of it is uh I felt like that was the best way to leverage what I was good at um like I look back now and I see like influence from my dad who like I said built the houses that I grew up in but he's primarily a, a contractor he's a builder but he learned enough about enough things that he could participate um intellectually across the full spectrum of the process from the plans the blueprints through to the finishing touches on a home um and i i viewed myself i subconsciously kind of built a similar skill set in regards to building companies and businesses um and like i learned design but i also learned the business side i learned the marketing side and i even learned how to do like front-end coding 
um, and hopefully have built more like interpersonal relationship skills and, and people management skills too along the way. Um, but I think that that really drew me to startups because you, you get to participate in, in a lot. And, um, and I love the ideation phases of, of companies. And I feel I've, I had worked at larger companies where I was focused on like one aspect of this certain app. And that's not, I, I don't like chiseling away at something that's, that's pretty good already. So in that, those first few months, um, what was the feeling that you were getting in your body? Like upon arriving home? Upon arriving home. Like after, I, I, let's, let's take like starting the day. Mm-hmm. What was that feeling just as you were starting this company in your body? Starting Mudwater. Starting Mudwater. Yeah. Because yeah. well, you mentioned Joe Dispenza. You mentioned like what it feels like yeah, in the well, body. I, I so think I, I do want to add that like, so when I, when I came home, I... I moved to LA shortly after for, and I'd never lived in LA, but I, I knew that that was my next spot. And I joined a tech company that was very similar to what I would want to join. Um, when I was like thinking about it in those, those meditations, I, I joined as a co-founder. I joined a company that was started by Paul DeJoe and it was a remote company. We got to travel. We went to numerous countries and, um, and we were building something that had the potential to be really big. Uh, and shortly after moving to LA, I got the calling to do, um, an ayahuasca ceremony. Uh, and previous, you know, I, I brought that podcast episode and was like really excited about it, but I also had a, a ton of trepidation for it. Like I, a Rogan, lot of respect. The, yeah. The I was like, podcast, I don't know if yeah. like, I want, like, I love that there's people out here and like, I'm really excited that uh, to participate at some point, but I, I didn't feel ready. And now I felt ready after traveling for, for some time. Um, and I, hit up Gary who was the one who was like first to go out in the jungle after listening to that podcast. And like I said, he was down there like three months later. Sure. So there's one of our childhood friends friends, who was, if you listen to the first episode, like part of this first crew of us all listening to this podcast with with Aubrey Marcus and Joe Rogan were like, Whoa, this is some crazy shit. And it all kind of spurred off from there. And so I knew that he had been down there multiple times so I just texted him like yo I'm really I'm feeling ready and I'm feeling like I, I want to participate in this experience and he texted me back he's like do you remember Kristen Appenrod and this was a girl who I grew up with like high school friends and um I was like yeah and he's like so she is uh partners with a shaman now and they lead they're leading an ayahuasca ceremony in Santa Cruz and I was like childhood friend leading an ayahuasca ceremony in my hometown right after I finally got the calling. It's their first time doing it up there. And I was just like, that's like, I'm doing it. And so I ended up doing my first ayahuasca ceremony that the went the new year's after I got back from India in 2014 or 15. Um, and up in Santa Cruz. And it was like the most transformational weekend of my life probably. Um, definitely the most transformational like experience like th- th- just shifted me out of who who I was and and really answered a lot for me um how so so it was a three day it was a three day weekend where you're drinking three days in a row um the first night is sort of a exploratory more so um unofficially like they didn't say that but lower dose and for me it, w- it felt like loosening up the soil a little bit like I had like you for me, I was like, had a lot of fear going into that. Like, I don't know where I'm going. Like, this is going to be crazy. Like, what if I lose my mind? What if I'm never the same? Like these type of questions that you don't want to have. Will this be permanent? <laughs> yeah. Those are the questions you don't want to have. But through that first experience, I, I was able to gain a lot of trust in, in just like the integrity of the space they were creating there. Um, and in the second night, which really allowed me to like, let go, um, let go more, like it redefined what that actually meant for me, the phrase letting go. Like it was so intense, so deep. Um, the experience, it, like there's there's music that, and the music sort of takes you in um, kind of the back door in a sense. Like you, you drink the medicine, you're like sitting there. You don't want to be, wait, wait, wait when's it, when's it going to hit? Wait, was that it? Uh, like, no, you want to just be relaxed and all of a sudden it just kind of takes you like a little river. And then maybe you have a moment of like, oh, like I'm completely gone in this, um, which I had, but I, I was so trusting the experience that I just kept going. 
and uh, soon found myself in what felt like a different kind of, I was in the same room. I could open my eyes and sort of see the people in the space, but was a completely different realm of reality. Felt very jungle like, and like I would describe as like very dense. Like it felt like the air had density to it that I could experience and see and feel. And like looking at my hands, it was like kind of vine like or like snake like illusions, kind of like f- weaving up my arms and different like colors and, and everything. So the, I was seeing like the psychedelic experience and noticing that like in a typical setting that would have like I would have been like oh shit this is gnarly but I was very I was so trusting that I literally got this message that was just like you don't need to you don't need to do anything right now like you don't need to you don't need to like think about what you should experience which is something that I noticed then that I did a lot like even in a meditation practice it was like am I doing this right if it started to feel if I started to feel really clear-headed it was like all right, what should I do here? Like, what should I do with all this, like, clarity, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and, like, I'm constantly trying to, like, extract value or purpose or meaning out of experiences instead of just letting the experience be the purpose, be the meaning. And for the first time, I felt that, like, it, it or it just, like, took me there. And I lied back. Um, and people have different experiences when they take ayahuasca. And, like, some people are, like, re- like rolling around in pain. Some people are, are vomiting. And I noticed that like part of me, maybe like my, my normal self was looking around like, I don't know if it's like hitting me right. <laughs> like, cause I'm not, I'm not experiencing that. Like other people are like, like, I feel bad. I'm not, like, I feel it's the f- those are the famous last words, <laughs> but, of course. No, but like, I felt amazing. Hmm. I felt absolutely amazing. And I, and, but it was just like, I felt okay. Just lied back down and for eight hours I literally was just like lying down almost like in kind of a half seated position and taken through a journey into my soul like in this insane way Uh, I won't go too deep into it but one one of the things that I do remember is it it was like these layers um well first of all it felt like there was an entity to my left that was kind of greenish just want to throw that out there and this was like this entity that almost felt like a like a doctor of sorts it was kind of going going through this experience with me kind of like guiding me through it in a way um and it felt like there was some communication happening but very tough to explain how that is nonverbal. um and exploring through my soul got to this point where it was just like I could see this universe inside of my chest that felt like everything that existed in life was inside my chest at once. And I was like, why isn't this, why isn't this out there? Like, why can't I release this? And then I saw this like cascade of like shields above me, like blocking it. (laughs) And each shield was attached to this tether. And I got to like go through certain tethers and they're attached to memories and those memories. It was just like this insane story. How did that relate to mud water? So coming back from that, I was, what one of the most transformational things that a psychedelic experience can give to you, I think, is a new outlook on like the day to day of life. It's not necessarily the experience itself. It's like all of a sudden I thought differently about what I was putting in my body. I thought differently about what I was drinking, how I opened the day um, and began working with an individual named Shems, who you've had on your podcast. He's um, the man. Sort of as He's like a an, spiritual gangster. Yeah. I love him. He looks deeply into your eyes and tells you the truth. Yeah. Gives it to you straight. It's very hard, but mm. it's good. Mm-hmm. It's like He does so in a very gentle way, though. It's like, it's like yes. Go deeper. Yeah, brother. Yeah, brother. <laughs> he's like, if you... He, he's someone who you would think wouldn't be such a hardcore badass, mm. and then he just gets right to the core he's yeah. like a almost like a tony robbins character in that way he's just done a lot of work yeah i would say that he's he's done he's helped me immensely he's helped you immensely yeah so you around that yeah, he, time were he fights working with, with like Shems. a very sharp sword but it's got like a foam sheath on the outside and yes. he sometimes like reveals it to you he's like, <laughs> i got this but then he keeps it in there during the session exactly. <laughs> and you're like okay i'm following you yes William Wallace, take exactly. me to the promised land. Exactly. Um, so I started working with him as sort of like an integration practice. Um, but what what I really wanted to work with him on is like what 
what can I build into my day to day that sort of keeps me in this elevated state and um, keeps me like unearthing some of the things that I had I had begun. Um, and so I worked with him. I think we initially agreed to like three months, but uh, it ended up just extending into basically a full year, culminating into like maybe ending maybe two weeks after I started Mud. And so while working with him, I really started to integrate what I'd maybe started in India compounded in this ayahuasca journey and then slowly built into like daily practices um some of which was breath work so he was starting to introduce me to various forms of breath work not like the transcendental but different forms of nasal breathing um and then different just forms of like being conscious in certain situations like at the office or with friends um that I started just to bring into my day to day um and I really felt that all of those things contributed in hindsight to me feeling very strong when starting the company and sort of, I, I guess you describe it as courageous. Like I wasn't unaware of the fears. I wasn't unaware of the cliffs that I could fall off or the financial situation or anything, but like courage is sort of continuing on. Right. And I felt like he helped me build courage. Um, and so, yeah, bringing us from there, I, you know, like I said, I was, maxed out to the fullest I was working full-time coming home on my lunch breaks and (laughs) taking things to the post office and then working but I felt like due to those tools I had a lot more capacity than I'd ever had in my life to handle stress Um, and I feel like that's a key component to starting a company because there's so many unknowns there's so many you're kind of like playing like whack-a-mole like there's so many things you don't know like a little thing pops up and you got to smash it down like there's all these little issues that arise And um, you need a lot of strength and energy to do that. And then you need like a a ways and tools, I think, to handle that stress or you'll literally break or you'll quit. Um, And most that's why most companies do. What were the the biggest problems you were trying to solve in that initial phase? Um, In the initial phase, there wasn't too many problems. I was just trying to I was trying to prove out that there is product market fit. So that was like the main goal. And that was I had to do that in order to raise money and I had to raise money in order to work on it full time. So it was kind of, what does product to market fit mean? Well, so you have, um, it's, it's the ability for a product to, to essentially meet the market's demands. Um, so like anybody can create a product, but if nobody wants to buy it, um, you don't, that means there's no market, right? You have a product, no market, or you could see there's a huge opportunity. Like there's a lot of people who need X, but if you don't create a product that meets their needs, then you don't have the product. Um, and so product market fit means you have a product that meets a market that's worth pursuing. Um, and with an investor, will you know, try to look at like how big is that market? And that ultimately can kind of allow them to forecast the potential of your business and the potential of the opportunity for what their cash could be multiplied to. That's a vulnerable space as opposed to working as an underling at another company because you're not really putting yourself out there in that position. Oh yeah. You, but you now founder. are like, yo, this shit's muddy and it's good and people are going to want it. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. Yeah, the founder definitely has holds most of the stress. Like when when you're working at a company, it's like you you try to do your best job and your best work. Ultimately, like hopefully you have a little bit of equity so you have some skin in the game, but compared to the founder, I mean, they're they're dealing with it, it's everything on the line for them, for sure. Um, but I liked that. Like I had already done, I had co-founded two companies previously as a co-founder. Um, at this time I was like a solo founder. So it was a little, it was a little more, um, intense possibly, but, um, to be totally honest, like I had like zero doubt, um, in it, like in it working, uh, at that time. Like it was just, there's nothing that like, I was like, this, it's going to work out. Like I, I was literally like, had I was in debt but I had somehow opened a credit card and by continuously paying it off was able to increase the max limit to 20k but I was like maxing that out you know like it it was pretty intense um it had to work yeah 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 you're you're what's the analogy you're falling off a cliff and building an airplane on the way down Mm -hmm. yeah what did your mornings look like yeah so I was living in Venice, um, really close to the beach, luckily. And so I would wake up at around seven and I would go run on the sand. I'd fill up a hydro flask with mud at the time. Um, I guess, yeah, this was after it was launched, but even before this was my morning routine that I continued through those first, uh, pretty much still do this in some capacity. 
um, run on the beach, find a spot about a mile in and do uh, a round of breath work. So I was doing like Wim Hof meditations at, or breath works at the time where I was doing three rounds of 11 breaths with a breath hold. And then I would do a 10 minute, 20 minute visualization, um, sort of like a derivative of Joe Dispenza's work. But at that point, I sort of knew some of the things that I was trying to, I wanted to manifest in the world. So I would just sit there and tap into that belief state and really like embody the feelings of the outcomes that I like pretty much putting myself in the position as though those were already true. What I was um, what, trying to transpire. What were the, um, if you can remember any, like the sentences that you would actually speak to yourself in that state in the morning on the beach? Um, yeah. Some is like, I'm grateful to be financially free. I'm grateful to have found my voice like these types of things where it's like you're literally speaking it as though it's already happened um but allowing like even speaking it out loud at times um and feeling what that feels like when you speak something like that out loud you really can feel your doubt come around like you're like yeah you like, that's <laughs> bullshit son <laughs> and that's super interesting and that allows you to kind of identify some of where that doubt is and then you work on that and then all of a sudden you're like I'm, I'm fucking great. You know, like you're getting it. And, um, you see this with like Tony Robbins and Conor McGregor, like people like elite athletes, they really speak things into existence. And then you see like a lot of athletes talk shit too, but there's like a difference where you see like somebody actually deep down in their gut believes it. And it's really the only individual can know that. But I think the more you do it, you can kind of see it in people. Like, do they really believe what they're saying? So you would sit on the beach uh, and be looking out at the Pacific Ocean mm -hmm. and actually say these sentences? Some, sometimes out loud, yeah. Yeah, I look like a crazy person probably. It's great. <laughs> Just like all the rest of the people in the Venice Beach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I would um, I would come home and, uh, you know, drink. I, I was intermittent fasting, drink tons of water, start the work day. Um, you would intermit intermittent, intermittent fast mm -hmm. often? Yeah, pretty much every day. So what, yeah, was, so your, what was your diet like during this time? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> My diet has always been very, um, very s peasant like, I guess you could say. But I mean, at this time, I was eating lots of what's called kitchery. <laughs> <laughs> what's called kitchery? This is like an Ayurvedic, uh, it's an Ayurvedic rice and like it's basmati rice, um, dal, and, and some, some different spices. And I started eating this on an Ayurvedic cleanse once and I found it to be amazing. And basically the concept is you could like do a mono diet on just Kitchery and basically do a cleanse, um, like simulate the benefits of a cleanse without starving yourself because it, you're, it digests so well. Like it's so easy for your stomach to digest. So you can give your, your, pro, your stomach, your digestive system a break while not starving yourself. Um, and it was just really easy for me to make a huge batch of it for the week. And honestly, like I would get made fun of cause I would just eat this pretty much every day. Um, and I would eat like eggs and very simple other, other items. Like I, I really up until recently, like didn't value like cooking and food. Like I was just like, I, as long as I eat relatively healthy things um like I don't really care what form it comes in like I don't care about how it's plated like I just need to enter into my my stomach <laughs> yeah it's just and, like, nutrition I, the ROI of spending an extra like hour in prep time and clean time of like making this meal return on just, investment there's no return on investment when you compare it to like just eating a bowl of Three day old kitchery. Like and I you're was, working 18 hours a day. And uh, it was completely out of necessity, too. Right. Like, I literally didn't have time. Was there anything that you would do to blow off steam, like listening to podcasts or, you know, people that could just allow you to take your mind off of this one goal? And was there any importance in that? For sure. Um, jiu jitsu is a huge thing. So I, I was training jiu jitsu at the time. Uh, and that really helped anytime you're doing something that's very hard and puts you on the brink brink of quitting will kind of take you out of everything else and bring you into that present moment so that definitely helped um and then i was listening to a lot of theo vaughn podcasts and theo vaughn is a he's a comedian and he has a podcast where he just i mean I, <laughs> he just bullshits like the entire <laughs> podcast and it's fucking hilarious and and it really allowed, it just transported me out of uh, the stresses of the day and, and just made life more fun and silly. 
brought a silliness to, For my, sure. to my evening. Like I would listen to his podcast while I was like slaving away in the commercial kitchen, like mixing covered in powders like mixing things yeah um, and it was it was very healing honestly he could talk about a pomegranate for 15 minutes yeah, and it'd be and it goes so deep. funny and it was hilarious so that was like my my medicine was uh was some theo vaughn laughs and um and then training jujitsu probably like i probably only had time to train like twice a week something like that right so bring me into the financials at this stage. So the you have this credit card, yeah. like for super layman, you know, yeah, like yeah. Well, how, how do the finances work at this stage? Because from the outside, it could seem that there was really no issue. Like, sweet, people are buying this stuff. Yeah. You're, yeah, that's a you common... got the credit card, like you're making money. And, mm -hmm. and people are thinking like, whoa, Shane's making all this money yeah. with, you know, how much are you selling these for? Like, damn, he's probably crushing it, like not actually thinking about the money that needs to go back into the business. Yep. So yep. paint that picture of the finances. Yeah, for people who have never run a startup company, especially in the tech space, but even in the in the consumer packaged goods space, it's like most companies when they're growing, if they're growing, um, which is a good thing, aren't profitable. Like they're not making money. And that's because like you are repurchasing inventory for the next month. And if you're growing the next month, you're buying more inventory than you did the previous month. And then you likely are growing through marketing spend. Um, so your marketing spend is growing simultaneously with that. Um, so you're putting more out and you're getting, you're getting more back, but like, you're not really going to realize that until <clears throat> a certain inflection point where the profit margin supersedes like your marketing spend. Um, or maybe you slow down your growth rate and you kind of have this rebound effect of recurring customers coming back and buying your product. Um, so this is especially true early on when your margins are likely very low. So your, your margin is like how much profit you're making after you buy all the cost of the goods that go into the product itself, right? The tin, the label, the box, the stickers you're putting in it, and then all the powders and then the time it takes to make it, all that is cost. And then you sell it at a, at a subtle profit margin on top. Right. And at that time, um, I was, I wasn't really worried about profit margin at all. Like I, I was thinking very long term. like I could figure all that out eventually. What we needed to prove was product market fit. I needed to get the product in people's hands. If people wanted the product, that's all we needed to prove. Cause we can find a way to, to get that product cheaper through scale and through making supplier partnerships. Um, and so at the time I was just ordering products on Amazon. Um, we could have gone, like I could have locked in, found suppliers. We, we were at enough scale where we would have been small time for a lot of these people. Um, cause they're dealing with large companies that are ordering, you know, thousands of kilos and, and, and we were ordering very small amounts and really only could due to my financial situation order like two weeks of inventory in advance and then had to like sell all that and order in the next two weeks but if i'm a supplier do i give you a better price if you buy a higher More. volume yeah totally yeah so you get you that's where you really get your breaks same with like if, if you're like on a totally small scale like let's say you want to get some t-shirts made mm -hmm. of your same, logo same thing. it's gonna be 40 bucks if you buy one t-shirt but that price will drop if you want to buy 10 in bulk yeah so like i looked into it for a couple of our ingredients and i found that I mean, I was an Amazon Prime member and what you say, what you pay on shipping from these suppliers, like I was saving in free shipping on Amazon. So really it was net neutral. Like I wouldn't have saved even at that time to go with a formal supplier. It would have been a hu way bigger headache and I would have had to put more cash down before every purchase order. Um, so I was just continuing on as, as usual and barely making it really like probably losing money most months, but knowing that like that's why right like i knew that we can get the profit margin down and most experienced seasoned investors will see that too what they really want to see is do people want what you're selling like we'll find a way to make it um so were that you was doing ads mentality. were you doing ads at this time yeah so on I, instagram yeah okay yeah so i uh i was learning how to run facebook and instagram ads at the time and like i was saying before like advertising similar to product it's like something you can do if people want it like if if you're making ads and people aren't aren't buying it then you literally can't run ads because you're running out of money like but we found ads that or i started to create some ads that 
were, you know, really resonating with people. And a lot of those ads were related to, it was a derivatives of fuck your coffee, essentially. It was like really f um, positioning ourselves as like a coffee alternative. So that was like one main thread. Um, but th probably the best thread at the time was, um, was very contradictory to what you'd read in like a marketing 101 uh, class. Um, and I was just like telling my story in the copy. So like paragraphs of text um, in the copy for some of these ads and like that it was just working amazing. And I think lar like whenever you can zig where everybody's zagging, then all of a sudden people look, they just like double take that ad, right? Like there's so many ads on Instagram. Like you got to sort of differentiate yourself in an authentic way and also like sell the product too. Right. So you um, were using more text in your yeah. Instagram ads. Tons of and text. And it was funny. Like, like it, it honestly, yeah. it sounded like a text that you From, would send that's, me. That's what I was trying it was like, to like get across. It was like that's the, like was the what funny I would heckles think. that you'd, we would send that's each other. That's what I would think when right. I would write. It was like, I'm texting Kyle like right. about this product. Um, and, and that just started to work really well. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's another main thing or that's a, a way that you can diagnose product market fit on one hand is how can you, how do you acquire customers? Um, can you acquire customers? Like, can you get people to, uh, buy into the promise of your product? And then the back end of that is once you, once they get the product, does it deliver on that promise and do they want to purchase again? Right. So those are like the two main factors there. And we were working on, on, I like, I, that was the main thing that I was looking to test. And that was the thing that was working. And that's why I felt very good about maxing out the credit card in my own personal health and wellness, um, in order just to get more proof points, a couple more months in, um, to eventually be able to work on it full time. Okay. Yeah running out of money are you still doing this all in your kitchen or had you moved We're, to a uh, commercial, was in kitchen? A commercial kitchen were, okay yeah. and what are commercial kitchens like uh so yeah it's like a large um commercial warehouse type environment that is all specced for commercial cooking and so there will be a bunch of different stations um and each station has like a stove and a sink and like all these basic uh appliances um that you would use and so that's where you see like meal prep companies in there um and i went in there like having no idea like how to use any of these appliances <laughs> like this is honestly <laughs> the first okay this is i make kitchery guys i've never yeah. cooked a meal I've other than literally kitchery. Cooked, like grilled cheese sandwiches <laughs> yeah. and kitchery like and popcorn it's all about calories <laughs> for me guys <laughs> yeah and so one night the first night i'm in there um I'm kind of like trying to pretend like I know what I'm doing a little bit. Like the, the, uh, kitchen manager's like walking me around. He's like, okay, you're at station four and here's, uh, like, what do you need? And like all of our mixers over here, this is over there. And I was like, I need one of the mixers. And it's like this five foot tall machine that has this big paddle in it and, and it goes into a bowl and there's a cage kind of protecting the bowl. Um, and I wheel that over to my station and I start, you know, I get my, get my formula out and I fill up the bowl I'm like I'm not sure exactly how high I should fill the bowl like the bowl like I should fill it up to the top like I'm trying <laughs> I'm trying to maximize production here yeah. so I fill it up to the top and this is like an like the bowl isn't like closed in any way like I don't know what I was doing and and then I was like how do I turn this thing on like I had no idea how to turn the machine on and <laughs> so you're still filling, and, fulfilling all the orders yourself yeah yeah, yeah. and I'm just like all right, like there's this there's a green button here, and there's like this little knob that didn't have any numbers on it, but you could like r rotate this knob, and it had like dots that like increased in size, and I like rotated it over to the right, and pressed the green button, and it just was like turbo mode, <laughs> and just blew up like a cloud of cacao <laughs> and cinnamon into the air, and I didn't quite I didn't know how to turn it off. I had to run over and pull the plug out of the wall. And there's people like next to me and they're like making like sandwiches for like these meal prep orders. And it's like, like a vegan salad. You're yeah, just it's like dusting the everyone the with mud. It's like vegan salad. <laughs> it it's was like, so like gnarly. It's like sulfur out of a super volcano it just dusts everything. Yeah, that exactly what happened. And, and I was like, oh man. So like we need a co-packer. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to need a bigger co-packer. Yeah. And, and a co-packer is basically like a partner that has you know, manufacturing capacity and they, they make your product at scale. But similar to like the, the supplier thing, 
the ingredients like we we were at decent scale but like not quite de- not quite enough to get a co-packer's attention and then even so it takes months to onboard with a co-packer and then um they have to find all your ingredients and then it was kind of like we were we were growing so fast that it was like you had we had to figure out a way to take a step back in order to like move forward at higher speed and I just wasn't quite ready to do that yet but yeah fully like at night at this point after work filling up my van at the time with all of our ingredients and driving to this commercial kitchen your little transit van yeah Vanny DeVito Vanny DeVito and like <laughs> loading like hundreds of pounds of powder into the kitchen mixing them all together bringing them out and we would we would package it up and we uh shortly after uh got kicked out of that kitchen space um it not the whole facility but they moved us into this like enclosed room um because I, we, we were dusting dude, people's sandwiches look, I'm, I'm just gonna just take this opportunity to let everyone know Shane is one of the dirtiest people I've ever met. No, no, no. <laughs> For sure. You, yeah. like... I've got a clean you get, conscience. You, you get, you're like a thoroughbred racehorse. You just focus on what it is you're doing with blinders and the dust and paint. I, I'd and say I'm not dirty. I don't like being dirty, and I, and I acknowledge it. It's just I have higher priorities. <laughs> and, right. And they, um, and I'm very task oriented and I know, I know what's important in life. And so, yeah, place to get it. <laughs> also known well, as you leave, you, you notoriously leave candy wrappers in your friend's cars. I do not eat candy anymore. That was in college. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the road to greatness, Kyle. I was very crafty in college too. Like I remember one time. <laughs> Venmo had just launched and I was in San Diego and nobody had heard of Venmo in Santa Cruz. And I took my, like, I basically had no money in college either. And I, um, at the time Venmo was giving out $6 for any person you can get to sign up as like a referral fee. And I took Ramon out, our friend Ramon out. Uh, I was like, let's go grab some lunch, like at a burrito spot. <laughs> and we, we show up and I order my burrito and, and I'm like, oh, like tapping my pockets. I'm like, oh shit, I forgot my wallet, man. Like, have you heard of Venmo? He's like, no. I'm like, dude, did you sign up? I can just transfer you cash right now <laughs> and get him to sign up. And I get like a little ding. <laughs> it's like, I get six bucks and I transfer it over to him. <laughs> he's just like, you fuck. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, I, I got by, you know, I got by. Just, just part of the hustle. Yeah, part, part of the hustle. hustle. Grind. Um, um, I uh, have a question about the tins. Yeah. How do you come up with that idea? It's a very unique package for a product. Right. I think part of it is um, having a beginner's mind, like coming into it with, like I, I just didn't think that there was any way that it should be um i think most people if they go straight to like the co-packer route most co-packers are going to like demand that you use bags because it's way easier you can put it on like a full line assembly line and it seals automatically and everything and at the time i didn't have like that wasn't a benefit to me so i was literally just like what is the best packaging i can use like i I had no thinking of like what is the most convenient packaging i could use it was literally like what's the best um, so the initial thing I used was um, a glass jar, actually. I obviously wanted it to be environmentally friendly as well. Like most bags, I mean, we, we ship bags now that are 100% recyclable, but like I'm not, I'm not like happy with that. Like we're, we're constantly have a quarterly project to find legit compostable bags, which is like really tough. There's a lot of people that claim it, you know about that. Um, but that was pretty much it. Started with jars and then jars were really heavy and they could crack you don't want glass and things you drink. And um, was it more expensive for you to ship? Was, yeah, so it was more expensive to ship. And um, and then I found a tin supplier, um, matte black. It just, like, really fit the brand because at the time I was putting these black labels on these jars and I was just like, this is, this is perfect. Like, I like to browse around and take in inputs and just, like, feel how th- certain things feel in, in a very... Like, it sounds very woo-woo, but, like, intuition is very important to me and something that I felt like I built up through painting, like, where I would just, like, see things on the canvas that I can't really explain, and I'd just put, like, a color here and there. If you've seen my paintings, it's, like, there's lines and colors and various spots that really don't have or need an explanation, but it really came from, like, uh, 
something in me that was just like I, it belongs there and I put it there and it felt better and starting to apply that to business I would just take in different options and just try to feel into like what felt right uh, which helps with speed obviously but um well, yeah, after uh, shitting on you for your candy wrapper habit, I will give you a compliment, which mm. is that you have intuitively a very good mind for design. Like, I've known you since high school. You made the Surfing for Change logo, which was like this early little YouTube documentary series that I did. You made the logo for the Motherfucker Awards. You made the logo for my podcast. Like, all of them, in my opinion, are dope, and a lot of people really like and talk about the branding of Mudwater. For sure. When you are going into any one of those projects, um, are there any questions that you're asking yourself or a process that you go through to come up with the right logo and branding for a particular project? Um. I think any time, any creative process, it's sort of like a lifelong uh, accumulation of inputs that contribute, of course. And then when you're going into like designing for a specific thing, you you want to tap into that, um, in, into that space where the more years of design you have, the more inputs and inspirations you have, and those sources of inspiration slowly become fuzzy about what they actually are and you just kind of remember certain shapes or contrasts or combination of elements and that's where it starts to become your own your own thing um and so part of that is it just takes time I think so when I sit down it's like a lot of times I'm like I don't really know what it's going to be and there's like a little bit of anxiety that occurs where you're like I don't know like I don't know if I have it like what's the idea like you're looking at a blank sheet of paper um but after looking through your own internal hard drive of, of inspiration and then even browsing around other websites and different things, you start to find something and then you just, I just start working. I just start like putting things on, on whether it's on paper or in illustrator, whatever it is, um, just start like making ideas, putting it on paper. Um, and then I find that around like the two, three hour mark, I, I start to kind of like a story starts to come through in a way. <clears throat> where um, certain elements seem to have like a connection, you know, like in very abstract ways, like certain typefaces to certain colors or certain shapes to certain letters, like, and I just start to see patterns in it in a, in a way that I wouldn't had previously. And it really took like hours of just being immersed in that space to, to occur. When it comes to the MUD slash WTR mm -hmm. logo, how many iterations of that logo did you go through? zero like one you know it just like i'm not kidding i didn't touch it like it was here's here it is like there was nothing else um so i yeah i grabbed my computer and i knew it was going to be called mud um and mud is not the, i think the domain name for mud is probably like four hundred thousand dollars something like that um and i liked the slash in the water because I view our company scaling to more like different verticals. Um, like we might launch a media arm. It's like mud slash media. We may launch uh, physical locations. Like we were, we have launched pop-ups and we call them huts, like mud huts. So mud slash hut. Um, we, we may make like a bar, like an edible version, like mud bar, you know? So it gave us the ability to um, apply that brand towards a lot of different form factors. So you thought about that in mm -hmm. separate, at the beginning, mm -hmm. you thought, I want to have this be a big enough umbrella that we can go in all these different directions. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting that the logo of a company could determine the places that you can go with it or make it more difficult to pivot. Well, I knew I knew where we wanted to go, and then I wanted to make sure the logo could accommodate that. Um, and, like, not having the slash, like, made it less able to be accommodating more verticals right so like that's kind of why that's there and then i viewed that as something that we the slash could be something that we could own um in a way so we're probably going to launch an apparel line and that's going to be like the main element like we're not going to put branding all over it but we will put the slash on it and why just wtr um uh, well aesthetically you have you have like three letters and three letters on both sides that was like one of the main things um i think it differentiates us from from other brands um 
It's just simple. And did you trademark it immediately? No, I trademarked it probably six, seven months after, like right around the time that we raised. Okay. It cost some money to trademark. It's not a lot, but it cost some money. All right, so let's talk about raising. So yeah, tell so me about a man <clears throat> named Paul DeJoe. Yeah, so I had worked with Paul in a previous company and about, I mean, I sent him a text right when I launched the website and he was like, oh, that's that disgusting drink you made me <laughs> try to get me to drink in Columbia. And I was like, yep. And then over the next like couple weeks, I would just send him like the sales summaries for every, like when we have big order days and whatnot. And it was like, it's happening. It's happening. Right. And like and, I was and talking to just you. to remind people in the first podcast we did, Paul was the founder of Cavalry. Founder of Cavalry, which was the company that I joined as a co-founder, right. Coming home from India. Um, and yeah, so he was the CEO of that company, but more importantly, like working with him, we realized that we have very complementary skill sets where his background's in business finance. Um, and he's an amazing like people person, people management person. And then my background more on the design side, the product side and marketing side. Um, so the two of us was like, we could just bounce ideas off each other in a way that was, uh, a very holistic view of what a company could look like. Um, and when cavalry didn't work out, we always had this, like, we were, we were planning a trip to Nicaragua before cavalry worked out. So we were always like, what's, what's going to take us to Nicaragua after that? Like when I was working at my next company, we would keep, we kept in touch all the time. And it was always like, we got to start something soon. Like, let's, let's get this back. Let's get the band back together. You know, it's going to, let's get back to Nicaragua. And, um, and so when I launched this company, though he didn't understand the mushroom space, he was a five cup of coffee a day drinker, though experienced tons of anxiety. So I knew that it would be amazing for him. Um, but I couldn't convince him to drink it when I was in Colombia. But after launching it, he was he was like, if you're going to go in on this, like he was definitely believed in, in me. Um, and so he was a part of it early on, managing, helping me like set up the, the LLC, helping me, uh, just guiding me like, yo, you should reach out to every single customer, like very, very all in on that. Um, cause he also wanted to see if there was product market fit here. Cause this could take us to Nicaragua. Um, and so he became like sort of an advisor early on. Uh, and then, um, six months in, I remember I had a phone call with him, um, where I, I remember walking out of my house onto the beach and just calling him and literally was like tearing up because I was just like, I felt like I was underwater. I would wake up every morning just feeling like, <gasps> like gasping for air. Cause there's just so many things that I had to keep in my head, um, managing so many different tasks and like, Oh, I forgot to reach out to that customer. Like this opportunity came up or this investor reached out, like all of these things and working full time and like making sure the people that were coming over to my house were getting paid. You're still working at this other company, I'm working full time at another company. Um, because of my like personal financial situation. And so I'm walking down on the beach and I'm like, dude, like I, like I can't quit my job because I can't keep up with, or like I need to have, like I would have to move out of my house and ultimately probably would have to shut down the company because I can't afford to keep it going. So I need my job just to like keep it up, but I can't keep working full time because I literally am dying. <laughs> I can't like, I can't think straight. Like I literally manage my day. If, it, if things weren't on the calendar, like it didn't exist. Like I, I was just like constantly in this like fight or flight mode pretty much. Um, and he was just as normal. Paul is great because you can call him when you are so sad, stressed out, angry. And he, he's just calm in the storm, calm in the eye of the storm and always has an answer that like makes you feel better. And this one made me feel very good because it's like, yo, I'm wiring you $25,000. And if you don't accept it, like, I'm not going to help you anymore. This is too good. This is something very rare. The testimonials I'm seeing, like I've been, he's, he's older than me. He's, he's run multiple businesses and he's like, I haven't seen anything like it. Like you're going to go in tomorrow and tell your CEO that you're, you're leaving and like, let's do this. Um, obviously $25,000 is enough to get the company la like completely off the ground, but it's enough where it could fill in the bridge, the gap between that moment until we found actual investors. And Paul is not an investor. Paul is like, that was like money. He was pulling out for like home savings and stuff. And I didn't even like, I didn't even know how to answer that. Like that's the most generous thing I've ever heard in my life. And I 
don't even think I answered. And like he hung up and then texted me like check the account and I was like, oh that's such a gangster oh move. Yeah. He didn't, even, he didn't even let Paul. me say no. Fuck yeah, Paul. Just hang up the yeah. phone. Ooh, gangster. That's a mic drop moment. Full on. Oh, I just Ohio got the chills. Gangster. Oh, man. And, I'm sweaty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so I did. I went in and I told uh, my CEO at the time, Lauren. She's an amazing founder and CEO, like badass woman. And uh, I was kind of nervous. And she knew that I was like slanging some mud on the side, like around the office. <laughs> and I was like, look, like, it was tough. Because I was, I really was a big part of that company, and and um, I I loved working with everybody, but it's like, look, this is you know that mud stuff, like. She's like, yeah, it's on your shoe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm I'm gonna be like doing that full time soon, <laughs> and like, really love your support, and she, I mean, she was so supportive. I mean, I think most solo found like she was a solo founder to start, and and so I think that. I had no, there was no reason to fear that because she knew exactly what I was going through and was just like completely an encouragement and was like, look, like, do you want to maybe like slowly phase out? You can work like one, two days a week and like still get paid. And, um, and yeah, it just worked out amazing. Uh, and ended up starting the fundraising spree and fundraising is, uh, fundraising is no joke. It's a completely, it's a full-time job. Um, so this is like on, put on top of the actual job of starting the company then all of a sudden you're you're out there like basically a salesperson for the company in a sense because when you're fundraising you're selling a portion of the company any um, for future value any great stories that can illustrate what it's actually like to fundraise so yeah the so the first person i reached out well first i made a, a deck right like which is something I knew how to do about the only thing I knew how to do in, in regards to fundraising <laughs> built a pitch deck, um, basically positioned our company in a, in a really good way, um, highlighting everything that we were doing. So I felt good about that. I felt good about the presentation part. What does that mean? What, how were you able to highlight your company in a way that looked good? Oh, I mean, I knew the elements in the deck that were, or I knew the elements that should be in a deck that would be, um, very appealing to, to investors what were they growth product market fit essentially but broken down into growth retention um testimonials market size that kind of thing um those are like the main the main things right um did you have a uh, testimonial from kelly slater yeah so so yeah probably like four months after launch um our fr- our mutual friend matt myers invited me to go out to a wsl event at slater wave ranch and uh, I brought some mud and I wrote th- the first day we went in there, I, I wrote a little note that said, I heard you don't like coffee. Like, you'll love this. Like, no, didn't sign it or anything. And um, I gave it to a friend, our friend Matt, um, <laughs> <laughs> who at the time was team manager for Rib Curl. I, I already told um, Slater's team about this. Um, and, but I, I was like, yo, put this in Slater's locker. <laughs> and he snuck it in there and didn't hear anything about it until I was on one of my morning ritual beach runs um, like a month later. And I get a notification that Slater just tagged you in a story and he tagged mud water and it said um, way better than coffee for me smiley face whatever but i was like holy shit it worked <laughs> and fully used that testimonial to our advantage um but yeah things like that we're going in the deck um and then the next phase of fundraising though is is being able to verbally convey that story um in a way that's inspiring and, and prove to somebody that you're the person that's uh fit to bring this business to life and then the last thing is like finding the people that you should pitch to right and that's that's typically the toughest part for a lot of entrepreneurs is building that network um and so i started with uh somebody that i knew from cavalry days um paul and i did a a team trip down to cozumel one time um because we were a remote company we would constantly we would travel every like three months together to meet up um we didn't have to spend money on an office so that was kind of our our office fun and we one trip flew down some people that we wanted to be our formal advisors and eventual investors in the company. And one of them, his name was Zach Coleus. And he uh, he runs an Angelus syndicate. And Angelus is a company started by Naval Ravikant. He's amazing. Uh, he has an amazing podcast. But he's like a, basically a philosopher, but also really big tech mogul. And he started this company that allowed 
non VC types to corral in money from various people who also had money, but wanted to get into these tech deals that were typically reserved for like the, the button up suit and tie venture capital companies. Um, so basically like somebody who people felt and agreed that had great taste and insights in the next big thing, they would be like, whatever you're investing in, like I want to put some money into that. And so they would create a fund called a syndicate and they would syndicate capital from hundreds of people and put towards companies. And so Zach Coleus was one of the first syndicate runners on AngelList and he ended up running the first syndicated billion dollar deal on AngelList, which gave him tons of notoriety around the industry. Like everybody knew who he was. Um, and we flew him down to Cozumel um, and we all had a great time. But one night everybody went to sleep and him and I were like, I kinda, we should do something. We went over to this place called Senior Frogs, which is like, a, like a Margaritaville type vibe like yardstick margaritas and like those big slushy machines and all that. And we just like had an amazing night and like on the dance floor, like singing karaoke, like just talking about VCs and startups and everything. Didn't really think anything of it, but through that, like I had, we, we had formed like a really cool bond that he didn't even advise or invest our previous company. But, um, f I reached out to him and I was like, I'm in San Francisco. I'd love to meet up. We ended up meeting up. And I walked him through what we were doing. He's like, holy shit. <laughs> like, love, like what we were doing was impressive, like what we had done in the previous six months. Um, but he had never, he'd only invested in tech companies, like never invested in a food product. Um, and food products have kind of like a different trajectory typically. They're like the, the financials can look slightly different. Um, and he was just like, man, I want to invest. Like I'm in, uh, but it's contingent on you finding an investor that's also a like, who's an expert in food and bev like i i have amazing access to capital and i know the ins and outs of maybe more so when you're like at massive scale but like i i can't feel confident without somebody else being along my side and so we use that as like a bargaining chip right like zach's in like who else is in right it's like um, a who's going to the party thing yeah zach's coming and then we got a lot of calls like literally my my schedule is completely booked up like i was i probably took like 100 meetings over the course of the next like two months um and one meeting in particular that turned out to be sort of his wingman on um considering this deal was uh, a guy named alex malamatidis and he ran a, ran a fund called uh nabari over in New York and I had never been to New York, but they, they reached out to us along with three other VC funds. And I was like, we should fly to New York, Paul and I, and go pitch them all. And, um, got a plane ticket. We, we had a red eye flight. We didn't have a lot of time. Like we were mixing product at that time, you know, like, so I, we literally flew out there for two days and flew back cause we had to keep up with inventory. Um, Paul's historically a very troubled sleeper. And so he recommended that we get some, some edibles. And I've like edibles are, are not my jam. <laughs> like, I, but I was like, I feel a good story coming. I was like, I've I haven't had edibles in like a long time. So if we just play it safe, like it should like a lot of people eat edibles. Like it's fine. Like we'll get a good night's sleep and we'll be primed and ready for our investor pitch the following morning at like 10 a.m. an hour after we arrive. And uh, so I go to MedMen and I I tell the guy I'm like yo, we're, we're, I have a red eye flight. I'm just trying to like get some sleep. Like I'm not looking for any sort of like life changing experience. Like I just want, we're looking to get some edibles, but like keep it like relax. Right. And he's <laughs> yeah. like, I got, I got just the stuff that like, gives me these like gummy bear things. Like, just, just have one. It's like Rogan's joke where he's like, how much should I take? Just a leg. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's crazy. Like you eat these like an ear off a of gummy bear. But like, so he, he tells me to just eat one. I don't even know how many milligrams there were, but it was supposedly pretty light. Bring them back, and we're getting ready to go to the airport. I'm actually driving to the airport and parking in, like, the airport parking, but I ended up taking my dose, like, before leaving, before getting in the car. And uh, we get in the car, and I took my dose, he took his, and we, uh, I'm, like, pulling into the airport parking lot, and I was just like, oh, boy. Like, I'm already starting to feel it. I, like, put on the hood of my sweatshirt, and I'm like, Paul, I'm just going to let you know, like, 
like, I want you to really take the lead on getting us on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, I just want you to know I love you, man. <laughs> no, like, literally, I needed him to take the lead on, like, every decision. That if something from, like, should happen. <laughs> yeah, at that point, until we were on the plane, like, I couldn't talk. And I was just like, this is fucked. Paul's like, why are you holding my hand? <laughs> and he's like, I don't feel anything. He's, like, kind of, like, jealous. I was like, dude, you don't want this. You know? <laughs> Like the thought of like parking my car and going from there and like getting on the shuttle and like going to the air like I was like this is a, this is a lot. It's You're a like lot. I can raise millions of dollars, yeah. no problem, <laughs> but the idea of getting on this plane is just too it much. It was a lot, and uh, and basically probably said I probably just like moaned more than like said any <laughs> words in that. I was just kind of like he's like you good. I'm like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And we finally get to the plane and we're sitting in different spots. Like I'm in the back and I just like go to my seat and I'm like, I'm like super thirsty, but I didn't really want to like ask anybody for things. I was like scared to like talk. <laughs> like dry no. Out. <laughs> no. I was like, fuck this. I, like couldn't really sleep. I was like in and out of this daze and I was just like, this is fucked. I'm over, I'm over edibles. We, and it was like a very turbulent flight too. We finally land and I get off the plane and I see Paul and I'm like, bro, like, how are you? Like, I'm still feeling it. And he just has this, like, crazy look in his eyes. Like, he's like, dude. And he, like, <laughs> looks down at his pants, and he just has the salt and sea on his jeans. Like, he pissed his pants on the flight. And I'm like, awesome. And I, and I take a, f- I instantly, like, this is, like, flow state like this is just what i do instinctively i don't even know what i was doing like i just took a photo of him and i just sent it to my dad like that was like <laughs> first thing i thought of doing <laughs> i don't know why i was like this is the best thing ever <laughs> and he, so i take a photo and send it to the investors i don't know why <laughs> no and uh and i was like what happened he's like well i didn't feel anything and so i took another one and then like still didn't feel anything and I walked by to go pee and you were like snoring in the back and I got really jealous so I took another one and then he just said he was just gone a fateful decision but he, he peed his pants sleeping yeah but we went out and pitched three investors that day and um and ended up closing them all and uh so what you call came, trouble in the winner's circle <laughs> yeah and came home and uh, because due to that, Zach was in, and uh, we closed just over a million dollars from that trip. Some so, people say pissing your pants you're not on cool a flight is you good pants. luck. Yeah, you cool unless you pee your pants. It's a good omen. You ain't cool unless, unless you, you pee, pee your pants. pants. So yeah. What did it? Was, so what? How? How was it hard to not act obsequiously around investors? Mm. So those first couple meetings were like, I was definitely a little nervous. Um, you know, like it was uh, one of them that we went to, it was just like a bunch of like suit and tie, like financial guys and, um, put it on the big screen and walked them through the deck. And they're like, what is lions mean? And like, you know, I have like no idea what's going on. Luckily they had brought in one of their associates who was like all into this stuff and um and me and him like through the presentation you know like i i contact on him like we're really connecting and like you know he i think he probably did a lot of behind the scenes work like filling in the gaps but i mean at the end of the day they really want to see the numbers and the presentation is one part of it then the due diligence is sort of cool like we we buy all that like we're in but we want to make sure that like all this is true right and so that's like the part where you kind of get it over the hump um but really like i felt pretty comfortable just being myself like we were launching a pretty unique product and i felt like that that served us well just and like, you had the numbers on, you, so you had impressive numbers totally. on your I, side i didn't have to like pad anything which right. was super helpful um like i don't know if i would be a good like wartime type presenter where i gotta like dupe people into which like some people are very good at it and it's not that it's a bad thing like may, like maybe there's some elements of their growth rate that weren't that were off putting and there's some concerns but like they needed that cash and ultimately proved out to be successful but like i i definitely feel very good and comfortable like really getting people excited about things that they should feel excited about but like getting them really really into it so so what did it feel like to get that wire transfer yeah so it takes so from the point of people 
agree like saying they're in to actually money coming in can take a long time part of that is that due diligence aspect and then i think this was this was around this was around like halloween of 2018 and i remember we we're really close they're working out the final details of like the contract and everything because there's always going to be this back and forth of like small terms adjustments and and you're always wondering, okay, well, we just requested this. Are they going to come back and be over it? The whole thing because of that, like, you don't know. The deal could just fall apart and you really don't celebrate until the cash is in the bank. Um, so it felt good to get the initial agreement, um, but I wasn't I wasn't sleeping really well until we got it in the bank. And that happened ultimately when I was actually at your brother's wedding. So flying down, I had like the final pitch um locking everything in and then we were kind of working out the kinks with the legal team and we were supposed to get cash soon and um and right when I landed I remember I got to a dinner with a couple of friends that were all there with you and I got like a an email came through and the wire was transferred and I was just like oh like huge sigh of relief you know like all of a sudden I felt like I could breathe again I felt like i I was like on a slack line before, like I could fall off at any moment. And now I felt like I was on a stable like plateau. And I was like, I can sink my teeth into this thing that I'm so passionate about and get paid to do it. Like, and I felt like that, I felt like that was a superpower because previous I wasn't getting, I wasn't paying myself through Mudwater. Like I was working harder than I ever had before and getting paid less per hour than I ever had before. Basically, when you think about that. And um, finally now I was like thinking like, cool, like, what's going to happen when I can really, when I don't have to worry about paying rent and, uh, and I can focus on this full time. Um, so it was a really exciting moment to think about that. Um, but ultimately I was able to just be like, it's there, I'm at a wedding and I got to have fun finally for like, cause I didn't have any social life up until that point, that moment. Like there was literally no time to go out. There's no time to talk to friends. I remember one time you came by, you were in town and I was like, yeah, you can come by. But I was like, you came in and I was like leaving with like buckets and you're like, Oh, what buckets the fuck of cacao. Is, going on? <laughs> is that that shit and you were showing like, me at the Bombay beach Biennale? Yeah. I decided to kind of, was it that. a little bit at the same time as you got to exhale and I'm sure enjoy it, mm -hmm. a feeling of like, Oh man, maybe I'm just on a huge slack line now. Yeah. There, there's moments of that. Like you really need to, you have to build mental dexterity and just focus on hitting the hammer to the nail and not missing. Like you, you, there's pressure there. And every once in a while you look off the edge and you're like, Oh shit, it's a long fall. Um, like I feel that today still, you know? Um, but ultimately I think you fall back on, like I fell back on a lot of my like rituals and practices that I did to like help keep me in these like states that ultimately got mud to where it was off the ground and it, and it kept me in like a good state when it, when the stakes got higher. Um, but yeah, some of the more intense things was like raising money from friends who weren't see like even raising money from Paul. Like he's not, that was his first ever investment check in a company and, um, raising money from friends who I knew weren't like balling at all. You know, this was like a, a portion of their savings. Um, and they were trusting it in me. And, uh, so I took it very, seriously it was like a huge honor honestly i i didn't feel fear too much um i felt i felt a lot of uh there's like a sacredness to it and um and i and to really commemorate that i knew i wanted to do something special on my own to really put myself in the position to honor that like honor the journey that had just begun really you know like it felt like I'd been working on it for years because of the amount of effort but really had just begun like now somebody a group of people believed that there's something here they're like cool go prove it and um and what I did was I, I ended up reaching out to the the group that I'd done that ayahuasca journey with and I had heard that they had been doing these like three month microdosing programs where you're not you're actually just microdosing the the ayahuasca vine, which actually isn't psychoactive. Um, if yeah, it isn't. It's the it's the MAO inhibitor, but it's really based on the practice of a dieta, which is probably how they discovered the combination or how they claim to have discovered 
the ayahuasca brew was by listening to the plants and and, and a dieta is where you really clean out your diet where you're eating very very minimal food just in general but also a minimal variety of food it's like just like rice and then you're eating like one plant some there's other things that you can do dietas on, but you, primarily you'll eat like one plant every day as well. Um, and in this case it was the ayahuasca vine. And through that experience, like you build this like spiritual relationship with the plant and so on it gets pretty, de- pretty deep. But really what I was trying to do was um, sort of commemorate the journey I was on through a very sacred morning ritual. So I was doubling down on the things that had got me to that point. <clears throat> through this like I had already had a morning routine but through this practice what they guided me through was like cool you're, every morning you're gonna wake up and you're gonna have a, a couple tablespoons of this of this ayahuasca vine liquid um in addition to that you're meditating for like 30 minutes every day and then you have sort of like this vision like manifestation type meditation as well that you can pound on top of it and then throughout that, you're eating a very clean diet, no no alcohol for three months um, or anything. And um, no alcohol, no drugs for three months. And pretty much eating what I was already eating, like in Kitri, was great. <laughs> so yeah. I was already used to I'm that part. I'm not a dieta. Um, but it was a, it was a really amazing three months. It was a really amazing practice like to open up that because it... It brought... It forced me to like think about what I was doing every morning. You know, like I'm here with money supplied to me by f- close friends and people that believe in me. And I'm thinking about that as I'm like sipping this every morning in this sacred like ceremony. It wasn't about like a psychedelic experience at all. Um, but ended up being, you know, probably a very mind transformative experience in the end, like possibly more so. I remember going down and seeing you around that time, mm. uh, and asked if you wanted to go out and get a drink and you said, no, I'm not drinking because I don't want to ruin this experience. Yeah, I, the other aspect of it was I wanted to be very present to it. Like, yeah. what an amazing opportunity to have. It's to... like I get to have sex with my fantasy girl. <laughs> yeah. Why would I want to do it drunk? Exactly. Yeah, I wanted to remember everything that was happening. I wanted to feel it. And I never would want to look back and be like, it. W- certain things would have worked out or worked out better had I been more present and been... Um, <laughs> like I'm a big believer it, for myself that alcohol really dulls my intuition. And I I've seen this through like my creative process, like through art all the time where like, if I'm hungover, I just don't have this, it's, it's a different feeling. Um, and so for me, it was just like, it was an, it was like a non-negotiable. Like I was like, I'm there's zero upside in, in partaking in that. <laughs> that drink or anything that would cloud this experience like w- why like it just wasn't worth it and so I had a very strong why for not drinking at that point and so it made it very easy and probably since that I've had like less than 20 drink. you know like I don't drink like it's for that same reason but you know here and there well you just took on a big round of funding I think it's a good place to finish Mm -hmm. this episode. But if you could go back to the Shane that was on that island in India, starting to do that meditation from You're the Placebo, what is the one thing that you would say to that version of yourself? Watch out for the the lizards. (laughs) Um, (laughs) You know, it's, it's there's a, tough, a rat behind you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a rat in the kitchen with them. Um, I don't know. It's it's really tough because like you don't want to pull away some of the things that really, really made it happen, and some of those things are hard, and some of those were like it, it's hard to discern like what was unnecessarily unnecessary struggle and what was very necessary struggle. Um, I you know I think at times I maybe doubted the value in like what because I I looked around me specifically after the the time on the island I I traveled to uh, Bali in the Philippines like was on a surf trip basically but in much more populated areas with people who were there partying and on their own different kind of journey and even then I was like 
still like doing meditations and I didn't have a job at the time, but I was designing companies. I was like basically working almost full time, just designing ideas and apps. And I was just like, I'm really different. And like, I felt like insecure about that kind of like, I was like, I just, I constantly need to be creating and it feels amazing. But like, sometimes I, I question myself when I look around and see other people like on completely different programs, having a blast, like doing their thing and not really it. Like I just felt very isolated, very different. And I think like that was like, it would have been nice to be like encouraged to like, just do keep doing that. Cause like, it's going to lead to something amazing. Um, and like embracing that difference, um, because I knew that that's what I've, it felt the best to me, but sometimes I was like, why can't I just like party with the boys right now? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I just, I just wish I would have, uh, accepted that a little earlier, but, but you know, I didn't know. Shane Heath. Yeah. Thank you so much. You. Hey, it's Kyle again. Head over to trendswithbenefits.com and sign up for our newsletter to get weekly stories about psychedelics, adventure, well-being, and more. And if you dig this podcast, please leave a rating on Apple Podcasts. It takes less than 60 seconds and helps us book hard-to-get guests.